Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. Our Saint Jacinta, pray for us. Our Saint Francisco, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay, we're going to switch gears up here a little bit. Actually, the title of this talk is funny. I was asking the Aguilars the, the, uh, what title, because I obviously I speak a lot about Colonel Ripley, and the title of the talk, I think, is the, uh, is the True Glory Can Only Be Born in Pain, The Life of Colonel Ripley. But the title I gave this talk, I've given uh, versions of this talk at other locations, and the title I gave was Colonel Ripley, The Model of a Chaste Warrior for Members of the Church Militant, which he, he really is. But um, what is the title? <laughs> it's True Glory. Can True Glory, Glory War and the Pain. But it's, it, it kind of dovetails that title with the, the subject matter as, as we ended the first talk on happiness and the role of suffering and, and how happiness, um, we can find it, it finds us, and the role of suffering in that. Um, actually, I was, if you don't, hope you don't mind me telling this, Mr. Schroeder, but um, when I first met you, he was telling me the story about his wife, who Karen, who passed away last year, and and how the um, in, in the end, so his wife was dying. They're, they're praying the rosary, and he would hold her hand, and he would say the say the rosary. Then he said it was like the most very very meaningful. It brought him a lot of happiness, but that was like probably the most painful time in your life. And I meant to bring that up in the first talk because it does illustrate, you know, how people look for happiness in the wrong places. So that's a good introduction to this talk on Colonel Ripley, True Glory Can Only Be Born of Pain. But it's not just true glory, but it's also uh, happiness is, comes from that. And so to, just to introduce the subject, I wanted to, um, to share with you some, some concepts from this book that was just published, actually it's on our book table, by an Italian intellectual, <coughs> first Professor Roberto Dimittei. Actually, Professor Dimittei is the author of the first biography of our founder, titled The 20th Century Crusader. Well, this book just came out. It's really awesome. I'm almost finished with it. But it's Pinio Correggio Leveda, Prophet of the Reign of Mary. It's a pretty, uh, pretty engaging title. And it opens up a whole can of worms. You probably want me to explain it, but that would totally detract. But later, if you want to know more about the title, Prophet, Reign of Mary, you probably know about the Reign of Mary. But anyway, I wanted to use something of the, the book as an introduction, and that is my favorite chapter, chapter two, deals with combative, the title of it is Combative and Chivalrous Spirituality. Now, a lot of people reading that title, they would say, well, combative and spiritual, it's just like, it's like a contradiction in terms. I think that has to do, in large part, to the fact that religion today has been very much feminized. So it's like in order to be religious for a man, that you have to somehow be soft and you have to diminish yourself. And that's not the true Catholic concept of spirituality. So this idea of combative and chivalrous <coughs> spirituality is something that's more in line with what it means to be a Catholic. So in this, this um, chapter, there are different subsections. So the uh, second subsection has to do with the subject of honor. And he quotes, he actually quotes a number of times, an author named Leon Gutierre, Gutier, if I'm pronouncing it right. <clears throat> he wrote a book on chivalry. It's actually in, we have in the TFP house here. And he, he quotes uh, one line from him regarding the medieval knight who was like the, the, the ideal human type, and uh, how they practice chivalry. And Gutierrez writes, quote, all chivalry is contained in these four words, rather, death rather than dishonor. So honor was the thing most important in the life of a medieval knight. And it should be the most important thing in every man's life. Professor Pino gave many meetings on honor. He said, the, one of the main aspects of the TFP vocation is to bring honor back to the earth. So what is honor? <clears throat> Professor Dimittei, using meetings, drawing from meetings of Professor Pino on the subject says, honor is the manifestation of the intrinsic good that exists 
in man. So every man has some degree of honor, has honor. It's greater for some than others. It depends on the dignity, the value, the worth of the person. That's actually linked to the person's function. So according to the function, a person has a bigger dignity. So that of the Pope, he's the highest authority on earth, has that intrinsic dignity because of his function. And then you have someone to be a washerwoman, that she also has honor, but it's proportionate to her dignity. So the honor, honor is the manifestation of a person's dignity, and the dignity is their worth. So he, he cites a, a meeting by Professor Pignon in 1978 where he says, a person aware of his own dignity day and night and lives in the presence of God, that is a person that has honor. And when he takes a vacation from dignity, he takes a vacation from God. So a counter-revolutionary should always live uh, his life doing everything he can to manifest that dignity. And that's what the medieval knight did. The medieval knight, <clears throat> he says, he explains in that chapter, is the ideal human type who was modeled after our Lord Jesus Christ. So our Lord Jesus Christ, he had a combative side. He was not as the sentimental idea that some people portray him as, you know, a do-gooder or a can you know, like a little candy striper, uh, petting little children on the head. Obviously, he was a do-gooder, he did good, but they forget the passages, episodes in the life of our Lord where he drove the money changers out of the temple with a whip that he wove with his own hands. He used, called the Pharisees whitewashed sepul sepulchers and sons of Gehenna. So there was that side of, 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 um, of a gentle side, a merciful side, a good side, but then there was a side of a certain combative side where our Lord faced his enemies. We see that very much in his death, actually, in the book there on our founder. He has some very good passages, the way our Lord faced suffering. So this is what comes out very much in the life of Colonel Ripley. It was one of the things that motivated me to tell his story is because he was the premier warrior of his day, Vietnam vet, but that's not what I think defined his greatness. It was his, his moral courage where he showed um, his, his, his willingness, his courage, to stand up for what is right, what was going on in uh, the military, things that changes that were taking place in our military. So the the talk today it's, it's going to be a little bit shorter. We can gain the time that we lost. Uh, I went a little bit over my time. So I divided the talk up into three parts. The first part I'll just tell. Um, do, can I get a copy of the book? Somebody from the back there. So give a, I'll explain why I chose the title "An American Night." Uh, which you can probably understand from the introduction, combative chivalry, combative spirituality. He was kind of the embodiment of the night. Then I will explain um, how Colonel Ripley is best known. Thank you very much, Mr. How um, Colonel Ripley is most known for a military feat he did in Vietnam, showing his moral, uh, physical courage. And then I will say a word about his moral courage. So to begin with uh, the title, An American Night. I received the grace to write this book the year before Colonel Ripley died. And for me, it was like one of the biggest graces of my life because it was like, and I received the grace to write the book. I had never written a book before. I'd written many articles, but uh, I figured a book is basically a sewing together a bunch of articles. But I conceived the idea of a book about Colonel Ripley and the, the title was, was part of it. I thought, I always envisioned him as the American version of a medieval knight, but also the picture of him in his dress blues, which is so extraordinary. I wanted this picture for the cover. So it wasn't just an inspiration for something, but it was almost like all of the elements were present as well. So uh, I chose this seemingly anachronistic title for a book, An American Knight. It's like, you know, this, this person's a medievalist. I don't know if you've ever been to Renaissance fairs or medieval fairs or people that they, they kind of lost touch with reality. They live in another time period. Whereas we in the TFP, we have um, a lot of the spirit, we hope we have a lot of the spirit of the Middle Ages, 
without walking around in you know medieval costumes, etc. Nothing against the medieval medievalists and the reenactments. I've written articles about such things. It's very interesting. But I thought people might take it as being a little bit anachronistic that I'm dub dubbing this modern day or uh, modern day marine as as a knight. Well, the reason I did so is because I knew Colonel Ripley. He was a supporter of our association, the American Society for the Defense of Tradition, Family, and Property. Uh, he was actually a great admirer of our founder, Professor Plinio Correa de Leveda. And uh, he first became aware of our organization, Colonel Ripley, in the mid-90s. It was actually at the time we published the last book that Dr. Plinio uh, wrote on nobility, nobility and analogous traditional elites. It's a book that explains, takes the allocutions of Pope Pius XII, <clears throat> which he always loved regarding the role of leaders in society and the important role that they play. And he actually applies that to, even to the American situation. We don't have nobility, but we have something analogous, our elites. Actually, Colonel Ripley is an example of an elite. So he was there for the launching of that book. He made a part of the military panel that we had. We had members of nobility. We had a panel of speakers. We had, uh, with members of nobility from Europe, we had social elites in our country, and then we had a, a military panel. We had Colonel Ripley, Admiral Moore, who's a former chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and then um, Brigadier General William Weiss, a Marine to speak. <clears throat> so that's how we met him, but I also had the chance to visit Colonel Ripley when he was at Buena Vista, Virginia, he was president of the Southern uh, University, Southern Virginia University for women. I visited there on several occasions. And I also took students from our St. Louis de Montfort Boys Academy, actually I think you were on that, one of those trips, to visit him when he was in charge of the Marine Museum, which at that time was at the Navy, Navy Yard. That was actually very interesting to take the boys there because I overheard Mr. Cesar telling somebody about Colonel Ripley that he had, there's a certain side of him that was very, we had a, a lot of innocence. So our boys went in there and they were like, you know, t intimidated with this great war hero. But at a certain point, the, it's like the, um, the, the, everything melted and it's like they felt totally comfortable with him. And, and I could see a side of Colonel Ripley that, he had a childlike side, so he was explaining to them, you know, how, how to, you know, Use take care of the enemy, eliminate the enemy, let's put it that way. And the boys obviously were fascinated by all of this. But anyway, being, having the chance to get to know him, to see him, provided me the opportunity to get to uh, appreciate the man, but to get to know him, to analyze him. And the thing I most admired about him was his moral integrity. Because of his exploits in Vietnam, at the time when he was still alive, there were many Hollywood producers that approached him with the prospect of making a movie about his life. And he agreed that he would help as long as the person portraying him, number one, did not use foul language, because Colonel Ripley said, as a rule, I don't use such language. And I attended his funeral, and the, the commandant of the Marine Corps at the time, General Conway, gave the eulogy, and he said, said it really said it really well. He said, yeah, he said, Colonel Ripley never used foul language. He said, the closest thing I ever heard him say to a cuss word uh, was doggone it. And it's funny because I heard, we heard Colonel Ripley use that word many times. But even more outstanding was his demand to these Hollywood producers that the person portraying him would not be someone, he would not be portrayed as having had a romantic relationship with someone in Vietnam. These are liberties that people in Hollywood frequently take to spice a uh, thing up. But he said, I didn't want that, he didn't want that to happen with him because he affirmed, I have never been unfaithful to my wife, Moline, and I never will be. So there are a few things more beautiful uh, and unique in our world than a chaste warrior. And we must be clear, when I talk about chastity, Colonel Ripley was a married man, just to be clear, chastity is purity according to one's state in life. So that means that if a person is single, that means he refrained from all impure actions, and if the person is married, it means absolute fidelity to your wife. So this is why I, um, Colonel Ripley had a clean soul, and that's why I wanted this picture for the cover of the book, which is taken by Anthony Edgeworth, actually Anthony Ed Edgeworth's son, 
excuse me, his daughter was married to one of Colonel Ripley's sons. In my opinion, I think Mr. Edgeworth captured the soul of this great Marine. He was a warrior capable of destroying an external enemy, but also capable of dominating himself and his bad inclinations. So all of this contributed to the choice of the title because I think he embodied the knights of old, namely honor and chivalry. So honor, again, is the person seeks to do everything in the best way possible so that, his, that their dignity shines through. That was very much Colonel Ripley. Uh, in that sense, he was very much like Godfrey de Bouillon, who was a medieval warrior who was known to have such a strength that he could cut a man in half in the saddle with either side of the man falling on a, uh, each side of the horse. So one day he was captured by the, by the enemy, pretty impressive, isn't it, with one swing. He was captured by the enemy and they asked him if, if he could demonstrate you know, this. So they were going to bring a slave and he said, no, I'm not. I'm a Catholic, I can't, I can't do that to an innocent human being. So they, they, uh, they said, well, we'll bring a camel instead. And they brought a camel, and, well, you probably know the story. He, with one swing of his sword, he cut off the head of the camel. Well, they said, well, you've got a spell on your sword. So uh, they said, well, fine, bring, a, bring a, another camel and bring me one of your swords. And he repeated the act. He cut the head of the camel right off. Well, I remember when I first joined the TFP, someone told me the story, and it impressed me very much because I remember who told me, it was Mr. Spann. He said, when they asked him, how can you do this, and this part that really impressed me, the member of the TFP imitated Godfrey de Bouillon. He said, he held up his hands. He said, I'm able to do that. Where do you, they said, where do you get your strength? Because these hands have never committed an impure act. That struck me very much. So that's the way I envision, you know, Colonel Ripley. He was very much like that. He was a powerful man, but he was a chaste man. He was a virtuous man. He attended mass, for example. It's one of my favorite things. He, he said, when a person attends mass, he said, when it comes time to sit, sit. When it comes time to kneel, kneel. But don't do both. So this idea of slouching down, you know, when you're kneeling and you rest your bottom. So <laughs> I find myself, and I, if I get a little bit tired, my back is sore. You know, Colonel Ripley's watching me there, so I'm yelling up straight. <laughs> so, and he always attended mass, daily mass at the Naval Academy chap chapel. And he always sat up front on the right-hand side. There's, they should actually put a marker there as a holy spot. That's where Colonel Ripley knelt up when he was going to mass. It's an example for others. But the fact of the matter is, is that when I launched the book, I had a certain bit of trepidation with the title because I didn't know how people would take it, you know, especially Marines. So I remember the, very well the first conversation I had with Colonel Walt Ford. He was a former editor of the Marine Corps Leatherneck Magazine. I wanted to see if they wanted to, you know, to publish something about it, to the launching, etc. because, I mean, he, he's a legend in the Marine Corps. And uh, frankly, the conversation was intimidating because here you have a full bird colonel. It was my first you know, real intimate experience with a Marine Corps officer. And so he started firing at me all these questions, you know, what is the length of the book? What is the title? Who is the publisher? And at a certain point, I was very intimidated, but um, at a certain point, he asked me the title. And that's where I really hesitated because I thought, what will this Marine Colonel think of me calling one of their legends a knight? Will he laugh at me? Well, I'm here to tell you that he did not laugh. On the contrary, most, the co most common comment I get, especially from those who knew Colonel Ripley that served with him, the common comment I would get from them is, yep, that's John. In other words, they didn't laugh. I mean, he's an American knight. They said, yep, that's John. They saw him as a knight. In other words, they saw what I saw in Colonel Ripley. And the reason this is, is I, I think that every man no, in fact does, have a kind of an unum that kind of defines that person, that you can define them in a, in a phrase or even a word. So Colonel Ripley's unum, you could say, is an American knight. He's not a medieval knight. He lived in the United States. He was, lived in our days. He was a warrior. He's an American knight. Now, the knight, as an attractive human type, 
and prototypical warrior was actually recognized as such by the United States Marine Corps, which I say in the introduction of the book. During the mid-80s, the Corps ran a series of very enticing commercials to attract their recruits. Some of you may recall seeing these. Um, the model that they used then was a medieval knight. I actually resaw one of these, my favorite one, is where there's a medieval knight coming back from battle and the doors of the cathedral <coughs> burst open and all the faithful are there. And he, this is where I understand, the, he rides his horse into the cathedral. <laughs> but it's kind of Hollywoodian, but there's a, what impressed me, there's a boy looking up at him with admiration. And uh, he goes up, gets off of his horse, and he goes and kneels down, and the, um, the king puts a sword on his shoulder, and it goes, and then he stands up, and he's a marine. I mean, it's the most explicit correlation that they make between being a marine and being a knight. I mean, it was very, very explicit. So that's that. I wanted to explain a little bit about the title in American Knight. So now I want to get into what Colonel Ripley is most known for, which some of you are probably wanting to hear, and that is his uh, physical courage. But before we get into that, I'll tell you a little bit about Colonel Ripley. He grew up in Radford, Virginia, a small little uh, Virginia town. Uh, as a typical, typical American boy, he was the ringleader of a group of young men that acquired the name of River Rats because of the amount of time they spent on the New River, which was in the back of his boyhood home. It actually ran right in the back of his house, which today is Radford University. The house is no longer there, but the river is there. Well, Colonel Ruby did not miss any opportunity to test boundaries. His favorite stunt, actually, was hand walking arm in arm across underneath the bottom of a railroad bridge which spanned the New River. Now, this was an alarming feat when one considers that he was dangling from the dizzy height of nearly 40 feet from the river below. When I was researching the book, I actually went there, went to the New River, I went up to the trestle, and I didn't climb out underneath of it because they had a fence there, but I would have climbed out underneath of it because I wanted to get the experience, what it was like. But anyway, we can already see in the beginnings of Colonel Ripley's life, uh, we see the beginnings of a legend and that is a young man who was simply fearless. So he was somebody that was, he was bound to do uh, courageous things. Now, he was m mischievous as a boy, but I always want to point out, I like to point out that he was not malicious. There's a difference between being uh, malicious and being mischievous. He was a typical boy. Because he spent so much time tearing up the countryside, however, he neglected his studies and ultimately developed his brawn more than his brains. So that problem would be remedied very quickly when, with the encouragement of his father, he acquired, or he, um, 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 he tried out for the Naval Academy. But his grades were so bad that he had to go to Naps, which is a, a Naval Academy prep school, to bring him up to speed. Actually, today, the, the prep school that he attended, they have have a, have a building named after Colonel Ripley. It's one of the honors that he received in life. So his father essentially locked him in a room and, you know, in preparation for this, and forced him to learn. So this was one of the first lessons in perseverance. When he, gives talks on, when he gave talks on leadership, he would illustrate, you know, perseverance as being one of the aspects of a leader, and he would tell about his days when he was studying at NAPS. Well, he was ultimately accepted into the Naval Academy, and he graduated second in his uh, no, second to last in his class academically. <laughs> so, <laughs> Colonel Ripley was not, he was, um, he developed his brawn more than his brains. But it's interesting to point out that he had some of the highest marks in physical ap um, ability, military aptitude, and leadership. But it, you know, it's incredible. Uh, he later on, in spite of the fact of how he graduated, he became a voracious reader and a lover of history, and he became one of the foremost historians on specifically the Battle of Iwo Jima. And one of his best friends, Paul Galanti, who I'll mention later, said that uh, Colonel Ridley virtually became a philosopher. So it's interesting how, you know, he didn't make the, the grades that he, that, he, that he should have at the academy, but he went on to really develop his mind a lot. 
So it's in my opinion, as I say in the book, it was at this point in his life when he graduated from the Naval Academy that he saw what he could be in life. He set his sights on that and he never looked back. So after graduation, he bypassed the 30-day leave after graduation and took and two days later, he entered the basic school in Quantico, Virginia. So while everyone else is taking their 30-day leave, taking a break from studies, etc., he entered on the path of his career in the Marine Corps. He was the only midshipman to do so. He later went to Fort Benning where he completed Army Airborne School, and not long after that, he was invited to join the elite force recon unit within the Marines and went on to complete the Jump Master course and UDT. UDT stands for Underwater Demolition Team. They were the precursors of our modern day Navy SEALs. He eventually also completed the Army Ranger course and many years after his heroics in Vietnam became the first Marine to be inducted into the Army Ranger Hall of Fame. He was the first one actually since then there was another Marine fairly recently, some years ago, that was also uh, inducted into that Hall of Fame as well. So after he completed this training with the Army Rangers, he was considered in, among Force Recon members as being a triple threat. Now all of this was a prelude to his first tour of duty in Vietnam in 1968. But it's worth pointing out that the amount of training that he completed meant that Colonel Ripley would be placed on the front lines in a very brutal war. But those who knew Colonel Ripley the best knew that that's exactly where he wanted to be. So during his first tour, he already distinguished himself with uh, Lima Company. Uh, as a 28-year-old captain, he already earned legendary status during a battle that occurred on March 1st, 1968, where he nearly lost his entire company. It was actually so intense that he ordered his men at one point to fix bayonets, and it was such an archaic order that one of the Marines looked at the one next to him and he said, fix bayonets, he said, my bayonet's not broken, why do I have to fix it? The Marine next to him said, stupid, put your bayonet on. Well, in the midst of the death and carnage, then Captain Ripley remained completely calm and this was his trademark. He was often said to actually have a smile on his face in such situations. There are actually photographs of this. You see him in battles and you know there's, there's a, a moment of calm and he's just, he's loving it. At his funeral actually I met a number of people who served with him and described how that he did things in many battles for which he should have uh, received the Medal of Honor. On one occasion they were pinned down in this elephant grass and they couldn't even stick their head above ground because of the number of uh, bullets in the air. And at a certain point, he just got fed up with it. And he jumped up out of the grass and said, charge, and he gave what they said was a rebel yell and charged at the Vietnamese. And they, um, they probably thought, well, this man's crazy. They dropped their weapons and ran. Actually, I talked to a man that was in that battle, and he was kind of critical of Colonel Ripley. So, you know, he almost got us killed, but what that man didn't understand is that when you're in a leadership position like that, you kind of know when you can pull something like that off and when you can't, and he, he made a good call. So after his first tour of duty was over, Colonel Ripley did not rest, but continued his quest towards military perfection. And I think this is an example of where his honor shines through, because he wanted to be the best. He was a, he was a, a Marine, he was a warrior, he wanted to be the best. So this is what drove him from the tropical forest of Vietnam to the northern regions of Norway in the winter of 1969 to train with the British Royal Commandos. During this time with them, he had the unique distinction of being the first Yankee to command the British unit when he was put in charge of Y Company 45 Commando Royal Marines. But this entailed him serving two consecutive winters in 150 miles above the Arctic Circle where winds would reach in excess of 40 miles per hour and temperatures often plummeted to 40 degrees below zero. He actually wrote an article about his experiences up there where he talked about the toothpaste would freeze in the tube, but he would describe the beauty of that 
reach and how beautiful it was, which shows a certain innocent side of his soul. Well, during that time, he completed the uh, Royal Marine Mountain and Arctic Warfare courses. And this was no small thing, considering that only the elite members of Her Majesty's forces are permitted to take such training or are capable of meeting its fantastic demands on both body and spirit. Now, by completing the British Royal Commando course, he received yet another distinction among Force Recon members. He had already endured three of the most grueling Special Forces programs in the world, but by completing the Royal Commando course, he was now considered what's called a quad body, a title shared by only two other men on the planet at that time, a person that went through four of the most grueling Special Forces programs. So he was no longer simply a triple threat, but a mortal danger to anyone that came into his path. This became painfully clear to the North Vietnamese when Colonel Ripley returned to Vietnam in 1972 and accomplished a feat so stunning that it echoed throughout the world, the destruction of the Dong Ha Bridge. Now it's important to know that during his first tour of duty in 68, there were over 500,000 troops in Vietnam, but in 1972 there were only 27,000, and they were the advisors to the South Vietnamese, South Vietnamese, Vietnamese Marines forces. And uh, actually, we have a, an advisor in the room, uh, Mr. Cole, today. So those who went back, Marines like Colonel Ripley, who returned to Southeast Asia, they did so on a volunteer basis and were often mocked by those returning to the safety of the U.S. for doing so. They would say, you'll be sorry. Well, on that tour of duty, the North Vietnamese unleashed the largest communist offensive of the entire war, and they did it during Holy Week of 1972. And I, th I think it was somehow, it was calculated by the communists who are, who are a materialistic, atheistic sect. They did it on purpose because they knew the importance that that time of period held for Catholics. Also it was strategic because a lot of people were traveling abroad in neighboring countries to celebrate the, um, the, the week with their families. So it was dubbed the Easter Offensive, and it amounted to over 200 enemy tanks and 30,000 soldiers. Now this began on March the 29th with a steady bombardment of, of as many as 1,500 rounds a day, which rained down on the beleaguered South Vietnamese forces in an attempt to discourage them. It was a kind of a sigh where they just threw everything they could at them. Many of the shells specifically targeted the South Vietnamese civilians who clogged Highway 1, which is the north-south thoroughfare, in a frantic attempt to escape the wrath of the communist north. Well, things reached a climax when the enemy forces proceeded towards the Dong Ha Bridge, situated right along the DMZ. Because if they crossed that bridge, they had a very good chance that they could reach Saigon and end the war. Actually, Paul Galanti, he personally told me that it was his opinion that by blowing the bridge, Colonel Ripley um, won the Vietnam War because it basically, the, the battle waged on the Easter Offensive, but it was like some years later that Nixon started the bombing campaign and we were able to force the North Vietnamese communists to the peace talks so that we could surrender is essentially what happened. But, um, so anyway, it, um, I, I also think that they could have reached Saigon. But the problem is there were two Marines standing in their way. Colonel Gerald Turley, who was also a Catholic, who had been ordered to take over operations in the area because the, the colonel that was in charge of the operations literally had a psychological meltdown. He said, look, you're in charge now. And Colonel Ripley, who was given the order to blow the, the bridge. Now, Colonel Turley, who I had the chance to meet and interview with the book, he would later admit that he knew that it was an impossible mission and that he was sending Colonel Ripley to his death. But Colonel Rip Ripley unhesitatingly obeyed. But when Colonel Ripley got there, he analyzed the situation and he realized that he would have to get to blow the bridge up. It was built by American CB some years before. He would have to get the explosives into the belly of the bridge 
which would require him to hand walk out into the bridge, like he did as a boy growing up in Radford. 12 trips back and forth, each time carrying two 40 pound satchels, explosives uh, uh, over his shoulder, along with his weapon, with his ammunition, with his canteen, everything. Actually, Colonel Ripley's, he was a serious Marine. He, he could have discarded those things because, I mean, this was an all or nothing. It was a very physically grueling thing, but he, he, kept, he kept all of that equipment on. So it was, and Paul Galanti actually said it best, each trip out into the bridge was a conscious decision to sacrifice his life. So each trip out was a kind of a Medal of Honor act on his part. To make things worse, there was a T-54 Russian tank that was disabled early in the battle on the opposite side of the river and although it couldn't move, it could still uh, move forward. It could move its turret and it could still fire. And it would, it fired, you know, it's 100 millimeter rounds and one of them slammed into the side of the bridge and shook the bridge and the vibration almost knocked Colonel Ripley into the water. Well, at one point, Colonel Ripley going back and forth, he noticed his, his strength was fading and that he was not going to be able to endure this, get this done, because he had been two days without sleeping, basically no food, very little water. So he realized that if he, in order to accomplish this task, he needed to invite God to come along. That's what he said during a talk he gave to us. And it was at that moment that he improvised a um, kind of a Catholic version of the Marine Corps chant, Hut 2, 3, 4. And he started screaming out loud, Jesus, Mary, get me there. Jesus, Mary, get me there. And it's funny, the South Vietnamese Marines, not understanding perhaps what he was saying, they weren't Catholic, they started saying, Jesus, Mary, get me there. Jesus, Mary, get me there. And then in between refrains, they would scream in Vietnamese. I don't know how you say this, but they would say, crazy captain, crazy captain. <laughs> this man's crazy. Well, when it came time to connect the percussion caps to the primer cord, Colonel Ripley realized that he was lacking the necessary crimpers to do the job, and he had to do it the old-fashioned way. In Army Ranger School, I don't know if you're familiar with this, Mr. Cole, they, they were trained in such circumstances to crimp the detonators with their teeth. It was called jawboning, so they would stick the primer cord with the blasting cap in the back of their mouth, and they would bite down with their their molars, and it was referred to as jawboning, but they demonstrated what would happen if you didn't do it right uh, with a, a softball. It basically blew the softball to smithereens, so one wrong move, Colonel Ripley realized, would blow his head off. So once he accomplished this part of the mission, however, he didn't get his head blown off, he went back out on the bridge and set the detonators and the time fuse into the plastic explosive. And he calculated the length of the fuse would allow him a half hour to get everything done. He felt this would be enough time. But when he returned to the bank, he was informed by Major Smock, who was the Army Major that was helping him, that they had found the electric detonators. So this meant that he would have to make a return trip to rig up a backup system in just in case the blasting caps didn't work. This is called seriousness. It's also called honor. It's called doing things right. So at this time, uh, the fuse had been running uh, for a long time, and it was at this moment where he had uh, saw a gut-wrenching scene. He saw a woman, as I said, they were targeting the civilian population of the North Vietnamese, the communists. He saw a woman carrying a, a child in her arms. Half of her leg was blown off. She had a makeshift splint walking down the road in a kind of a daze and her young daughter was some distance behind her crying hysterically trying to keep up and Colonel Ripley saw that scene and he said if this bridge blows there's no way that that girl will survive the, the, the blast so he forgot what he was doing momentarily ran after the child swooped her up in his arms and was running almost when he reached the mother the bridge blew he was thrown into the air, pirouetted, and landed on his back. And he describes how the last thing he saw were images, not images, 
it was an image, uh, chunks, big chunks of the Dong Ha Bridge pirouetting up into the sky. <laughs> so he had accomplished the mission. The little girl landed on his chest, and when it was all over, she got up and ran back to her mother. So when it was all over, Colonel Ripley um, telephoned um, Colonel Turley and basically said, mission accomplished. Very succinct, and they went on with the battle, which raged for for actually several more weeks, a month, and until they finally, they won that battle. For his efforts, he received uh, the Navy Cross, and anyone who hears the story does not know why Colonel Ripley did not get the Medal of Honor. Actually, I was working with a commission started by um, Congressman Walter Jones of North Carolina to get him upgraded. Recently, they, we brought Ollie North on board because at that time he was president of the NRA, but then all of a sudden, Congressman Jones died earlier this year, and then Ollie North, you know what happened with him. He's no longer president of the NRA, so that kind of fell apart, but they're still trying to get him upgraded. Now, that's what Colonel Ripley did in Vietnam, and as I said, he did many other things. So Colonel Ripley showed a great moral courage, physical courage, but that is not, in my opinion, what made him uh, define his greatness, as I, defined it in an American night. His greatness was defined more in his moral, moral courage. And actually, Colonel Ripley himself said uh, on several occasions that there are two types of courage, physical courage and moral courage, and he said of the two, moral courage is the greater. And he defined it as, quote, sticking up for your principles when they turn up the heat. Actually, uh, an acquaintance of mine, Lieutenant General, retired Lieutenant General Ron Bailey, recently gave a talk about leadership and touched on this point as well. One of the elements of a leader, he said, is integrity, which is linked to honor that we dealt with earlier, which means that you don't compromise on your core values of honor, courage, and commitment. A Marine of integrity, he continued, will do the right thing. He will make the right decision because he looks at it from the perspective of it's not about me, it's about the organization, it's about service. We could just as easily say the same thing. It's not about me, it's about the Catholic cause when we go about carrying out our activities. So this is what is at least implied in the Marines' hymn, which boasts of them being the first to fight for right and freedom and to keep our honor clean. Now, my understanding of right in that phrase here means what is true, what is good, what should be defended. However, the key word, uh, key word in the stanza is honor. Uh, it's a term that is often thrown about, but is seldom defined. Professor Plinio described it as the quality whereby one seeks more, better, and always upwards. He also defined it as the esteem that we pay to that which is excellent. This is where the the term we, we get when we say we honor someone, it's giving them the esteem that they deserve. Now among the synonyms for honor, there are integrity, high morals, and honesty, just to name a few. So it stands to reason that a man of honor does the right thing because it is the right thing, no matter the consequences. This is what sets Colonel Ripley apart from so many other men. He had the courage to speak the truth when it would have been more convenient for him to remain silent. And he did this on several occasions in the mid-90s when he spoke about several issues pertaining to good order and conduct in the military. You probably know the ones I'm referring to. It was during the Clinton era in 1995, I think it was, when they were talking about allowing open homosexuals to serve in the military and sending our women into combat. Colonel Ripley actually gave expert testimony on both of those issues, and you can find in, in this book, the, uh, there are appendices in the back of the book, his testimony on both of those, on allowing open homosexuals to serve in the military and sending our women into combat. And to my knowledge, it's the only place in print you can find it unless you're Sherlock Holmes, because these things were, were buried. Well, now the reason that we have them, the reason we were able to publish them, is because he personally gave them to a member of the TFP, Mr. Preston Knoll, when he came to visit at that time and gave us some lectures. 
because he wasn't ashamed of giving it. He, he said, I have a copy of those testimonies he personally gave us. So it's word for word mm -hmm. what he said in those um, testimonies. And I highly recommend, if you, if you haven't gotten the book, that if you do nothing else but read those testimonies, then I will say, well done, because I think they are, are um, they're manifestos of the values we Americans hold most dear. So, the issue of women in combat, actually, one of the issues that he debated was so strongly, uh, when, he, when he gave the testimony on, testimony on that, it was such a hot button issue that he was strongly encouraged by his superior officer not to testify, but he was never ordered not to, which is something I appreciate, appreciate about Colonel Ripley. Had he been ordered not to give it, he would have saluted smartly and fallen out. But he told a member of our organization that after doing so, after giving that testimony, he, he became persona non grata at the United States Naval Academy. And you have to understand, the United States Naval Academy, he is a distinguished graduate there. I think he's the only Marine to get this distinguished graduate award it's at the Naval Academy where, if you go into Bancroft Hall, which is the, the center building at the center of the, cat, the academy, it's where their dining hall is, it's where their, their sleeping quarters is located. You go up the stairs, you have Bancroft Hall, and to the left there is a diorama of showing Colonel Ripley under the bridge, and then right next to it is a, a painting done after his death, a huge painting on the wall there. So this is a man that represented that for the United States Naval Academy, a man who received the Navy Cross, so many other awards, yet he was treated like mud after he gave the testimony. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called character. He had character. That means he was able to sacrifice his reputation and good standing and even his legacy, which there's nothing wrong with wanting to be thought well of after your death, he sacrificed it all in order to speak the truth. When I speak about his legacy, I must point out that there is still a lot of silence around Colonel Ripley. There are, there are things that happen from time to time. There is a uh, memorial that was dedicated to him at the Marine Corps Museum. They have a, if you ever go there in Quantico, the new museum, they have a walking path, and they have a memorial to Lima Company, and, and so he, he got a tribute there. <clears throat> but I personally don't think that he gets the recognition and death that he, that he deserves. Now, the point about these two issues, I always say, I don't have to say it for this audience, but some may agree with Colonel Ripley on these issues, and some may disagree. I speak at some audi audiences about this about Colonel Ripley, and I find people that don't agree with him on, well, women in combat, we should have women in combat. Uh, so some people disagree. Some people may admire him for speaking on these issues. Some may loathe him for doing so. But what I always say is, love him or hate him, no one in this room can deny the value of a man who was not afraid to speak his mind. In the book, I quote General Patton as saying that, what this country needs are a few great men who say what they think, not what they think others want them to think. And I think the reason our country's in the mess it's in now is because we don't have people who have the courage to say what they think. They're always testing public opinion, seeing where they can go. And look, I, will, I totally can appreciate a person giving, you know, kind of a political answer in certain situations, etc. But there are times where you have to speak the truth. You have to say the truth. And Colonel Ripley had the courage to do that. And what's interesting is Colonel Ripley was not a man that you had to twist his arm to get him to speak about these issues. Actually, his son Thomas, who helped me a lot with the book, he told me that if you wanted to know what he thought about a particular issue, all you had to do was ask him, but you had better be ready for his response. Now the value of such testimonies can only be truly appreciated when we consider the courage it takes to go against public opinion. This is because man is a social creature, and thus it is natural that he desire to get along with others. 
However, there are times in our lives when we must speak our mind, even if it goes against the dominant public opinion. There are those who prefer to take a safe position and remain silent. They do so because of the unbelievable pressure a person receives when he stands up on the wrong side of such issues, like those mentioned above. Things such as ridicule, ridicule, scorn, and betrayal. Such men who should be held up as examples to follow are often ostracized and cast aside. Now to illustrate this, I could illustrate it with the case of Senator Jeremiah Denton. Some of you may be familiar with him. He was a, um, he was a POW, shot down in Vietnam, spent I think seven or eight years in a POW camp. And he was the only senator to oppose the nomination to the Supreme Court of a person who was notoriously known to be pro-abortion, that was Sandra Day O'Connor. Just, how, what time does this end, Mr. Cesar? I don't want to go over my time. Is uh, you have till uh, uh, 11, yeah, uh, five minutes. Five minutes, okay. So he was the only one to um, oppose uh, Sandra Day O'Connor but in spite of the fact that he was the only one to oppose her nomination, he said in the presence of a member of the TFP that the pressure he received to go along and to vote with her, in spite of the fact that he was the only one, it was more difficult to, to resist that pressure than to resist the pressure that was placed on him in, in the communist prison camp. So in other words, the psychological torture that they use in the prison camp was easier to, to withstand uh, than the uh, pressure that he was placed, that was placed on him to vote for Sandra Day O'Connor. So this story shows very well how difficult it is for a person like Colonel Ripley to buck the system and affirm his principles. So, so this is one of the principal lessons I wanted to transmit in the book. I would not have wasted an ounce of my energy and time recalling what everyone else said about Colonel Ripley, his moral, his physical courage, and not deal with this part, someone who possessed both physical and moral courage. So he was the type of man, Colonel Ripley, because he had that moral courage, he was the type of person that the, who at the end of the day could look himself in the mirror and not be ashamed of the person staring back. So, in conclusion, I would say that it's already been 11 years since Colonel Ripley passed away in his sleep. He has already gone before his private judgment, as we will all go through one day. But at the end of time, he will go to the final judgment that will be exercised over all the members of the human race. I actually once read a beautiful reflection on this event in a book titled, in times and the future world to come. Some of you might have heard about it. It was St. Teresa and Jesus, one of her favorite books. The author of this book describes how when this grand event takes place, the final judgment, quote, this is very beautiful, there will be no distinction of wealth, birth, and rank among human beings. Those whose names are Alexander, Caesar, and Diocletian will be judged together with the herdsmen who at this moment are grazing their flocks on unknown deserted shores where the ashes of these masters of the world lie scattered. So at the last judgment, a man will not be honored because he was a king, an eloquent orator, a minister, and a great statesman. All of these honors and distinctions which the world holds in such high esteem will be deemed of no merit and no value. Man will be solely, will be praised solely for their virtues and their good works. Period, close quote. A very interesting perspective. So what drove me to write the life of Colonel Ripley was to narrate his good works and virtues in order to honor one of our country's greatest, but also to encourage those like you seeking an example like him to follow. After Colonel Ripley's death, there were many commentaries about him that appeared in the blogosphere. One of them came from an American mother, and it truly touched me very much. She says, I never had the chance of meeting Colonel Ripley, but in fact, uh, before a dear friend suggested that I look him up, I had never even heard his name. 
But I have sat here and read and reread the stories of his life and countless postings by people who loved him, and I will miss him dearly. I am a simple American mother, a woman, enjoying a world that Colonel Ripley dedicated his life to protecting. I am humbled by the recounts of his tireless dedication to his country. I suppose I'd just like to say thank you. Thank you from the core of my being on behalf of my four children. When the time is right, I will teach each of them of this great man, Colonel John Ripley. May God bless your soul. Period. Close quote. So, ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Ripley truly did lead a life worthy of a, of a book, but even if there had never been a book about him, his deeds are recorded in that magnificent book called the Book of Life, and so are yours. Therefore, I recommend to you to follow Colonel Ripley's example. Be courageous, be honorable, and be always faithful. Thank you very much.